Hi everybody, this is chapter three in our Michael Fullan textbook, um, and we're going to be looking at the road to school improvement. So one of the things that I want to note um, that I think is important, this chapter introduces us to the concept of different stakeholders and different authors and who their contributors are. Um, as new doctoral students, you need to see connection and collaboration between some authors. This chapter is written by Richard Elmore. Richard Elmer works hand in hand with, uh, with Dufour, who's the author of our other textbook. Um, when you see Dufour, you're going to see professional learning communities. When you see Dufour tied with Richard Elmore, you're going to see school improvement in professional learning communities. When you see Dufour with Marzano, you're going to see observation and assessment tied with professional learning communities. Try to figure out who does what, grow a network, and start recognizing names. Um, when you're able to do this, this is going to make you more effective as a scholar. It's also going to help you identify who the appropriate people are for research. So one of the most powerful statements in this chapter discusses how school turnaround really occurs. The authors really stress that you know, you're going to have, a, you're going to have different periods of school turn, turnaround where there's lots of improvement, then eventually um, it's going to have a lull, things are going to be static, and it could even decline a little bit as well. So we have a predictable pattern. New person comes in, they're going to spark turnaround, they're going to change, they're going to make a change that's going to improve the school, and then things are going to pretty much stabilize. So what's going to happen? So what we know on school reform, this really should surprise nobody that's watching this video, in my opinion. So I call this something different. I call this the adrenaline shot approach. Um, I see, and I see this in higher education as well, when somebody new comes in in any occupation, I mean, this is business, this is higher ed, this is K-12, the first thing they're going to do, they're going to shoot adrenaline into the organization. They're going to offer something that wasn't there before. People are going to get on board. They're going to get involved. Um, and the school's magically going to improve, or the organization is going to improve. Once that happens, that adrenaline that that person caused is going to plateau off. So then that person has to look at the people that are currently in place, look at the culture, look at the organization itself, and say, what can I do to improve? That person also has to be committed to improvement and have people on board with them that want to improve. If I want to change, I don't know this, I did this doctoral program at all. It doesn't matter if, you know, I can come in and change it. If the people that are in my department don't want to change it, no change is going to occur. When I came in, I offered something different and unique to this program. I was one of the ones that could teach school finance. Um, because of that, they had a full-time faculty, full faculty member that was tenderline who could do school finance. So that was kind of my adrenaline shot that I brought into this program. But to further develop it and further grow other courses, I would need the support of the other full-time faculty members to make that happen. So, our authors really stress that this happens really when people start to use existing resources better. And this is you know, really what I think is the premise of this chapter. You have to understand what the people that you have in your organization are capable of doing. This is a human capital management concept. And figure out how to utilize them as good resources that are appropriate for school improvement. Um, if I tasked every person in this class and said, you have to change your building or change your organization. The first thing that all of you would do would look at your staff, you would see who your supporters are, who your helpers are, and then you would use them to help you improve the school. And I think that's one of the big ideas that you have to keep in mind when we're looking at school improvement. So they talk about slumps. I call them plateaus because I think you're going to see more plateaus in school improvement um, than, than, than a slump. Things are going to, you know, if you're if you're turning around an F school and you can make and you can get it up to a C minus or a C school, it's probably going to plateau at that for a few years, and it might only make small improvements after that. So when that occurs, you have to figure out what you can do to survive it and then improve it. So our authors offer four specific strategies. They note that good leaders and good reformers expect flat periods to occur. They have a theory as to how what they're doing will result in improved school performance, and this might take time. This might be a strategic plan. It might take one year, three years, five years, or ten years. They have finer grain measures for detecting improvement, so little minor changes that can occur that can actually improve the school setting. 
and if something isn't working, they make adjustments and they abandon it uh, in the first place. If evidence suggests something isn't working, there's nothing wrong with abandoning it. So one of the things that we have to consider is if you expect the flats and you persist, you have to, you have to focus on the minuscule things after you make the major reforms first. I say this to not offend any science teachers or, or to offend any social studies teachers, but if you were in a building and you were told that this, the, the flaws in your district were math, science, and social studies, and you're the building principal and you have to pick one to do first, if you don't pick math, you are not an effective building principal because you know that your performance is going to be evaluated on improving math. It is a higher priority. Can you use science to improve math? Yes. Can you use social studies to improve English? Yes. But your focus has to be on prioritizing, setting, setting your higher goals first, and then working on the finer grain measures, which might be improving science instruction or history instruction. Um, if you don't understand how to set priorities, you're not going to be an effective leader, especially somebody getting a doctorate and that's eventually going to be in central administration. You have to know how to prioritize and to encourage your building principles to prioritize. So we have school superintendents, especially in your larger urban school districts, that are focused on school improvement immediately and continuously. Um, what will happen is they'll bring in a rock star building principal. So the rock star building principal comes in, they say, boom, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna change it, and then all of a sudden that rock star building principal makes those changes, and then they realize, I can't do anything else, so I'm gonna to go, to to go to a different district, and I'm going to seek higher ground. The question that I would ask you in a face-to-face -face class is, is there anything wrong with this? Um, think about the culture that we have in building leadership. If a building leader leaves, is there anything wrong with that? If they're trying to better themselves and get more buildings under their belt, that's a common practice across the United States. Um, how do we change the profession to stop this? Um, I think we reward people that are effective building leaders and that want to make change, and we encourage them to be building leaders and show them that being a building principal can eventually lead to promotion to central administration within the district. And this relates to kind of my research of succession planning and why I think it's important to look at the people that you have within first, and if they're doing something appropriate, and they can plan for people underneath them to essentially assume their role if they move up, there's nothing at all wrong with that. And I find that to be a major element of school improvement and school reform. So I think having a theory is equally important. Um, if you think you can turn around a school in three years and show gains, you need to be given three years to do it. Um, if you're a superintendent and you know that there's a school that's failing and you're interviewing somebody to come in as a building principal and they tell you that they need three years for a turnaround, you have to give them three years for that turnaround. Um, you honor your board and you honor your commitment and help them along the way as long as they have a plan as to what it should look like after one year, what it should look like after two years, and what it should look like after three years. Your initial analysis of your strategic plan has to be clear, given to the superintendent so that they understand where the theory is coming from and why you think it's going to take three years. You can't just arbitrarily say, I'm going to fix the school in three years. You should have a plan as to what you're going to do in year one, year two, and year three. It may take you four. It may take you two. But you should have a plan that's mutually agreed upon between you as the building principal or you as the district superintendent where you can work together to reach those goals. And that relates to this idea of having a theory to improve, your, to improve basically your district as a whole through building level reform. So the authors don't provide an example of what a finer grain measure is. They say, to, they say to focus on them once you've improved all of the major things that need improved. Um, I think finer grain measures can be things that are just going to do little quality improvements in the building that can improve, the, improve just the culture, the climate, and the, and the attitude of your teaching staff. One of the things that I mentioned is the idea of common planning time. That could be a finer grain measure. If everybody has a planning period and then you can somehow reassign it for common planning time, that's a good idea. One of the kickbacks that I always get when I talk about common planning time is, you know, you'll get the person who says, well, this is going to impact the music teachers or the art teachers or the home ec teachers. You are doing school reform. Your thoughts should not be on the music teacher, the art teacher, or the home ec teacher. They are elective teachers. 
If you have to overwork an elective teacher to release pressure on your math teacher, your English teacher, your science teacher, your social studies teacher, you do that. They get the priority, not the elective subjects. Are the elective subjects important? Yeah, the students love them, but your priority to establish common planning time needs to be on your core subject areas. And that's one of the easiest things that you can do that is a fine-grained measure. What about something like changing when, when students report to school? It, we've had research that has consistently told us that if we let elementary students start earlier in the morning, they're going to be up anyway, we let our high school students start later in the day, that could be a finer grade measure that could improve the climate in your building. Something to think about. So I'm going to say this throughout the rest of the class. Um, I'm going to talk about adjustments and what you need to do. If something isn't working, you abandon it. Uh, people go down with the ship all the time, they wait for a change to occur, and it never does. And that can be a massive, massive, massive problem. That three-year strategic plan we were talking about in the beginning of this lecture, well, what if year one goes, goes on and it's not working and you didn't hit your goals? You need to adjust your goals. Um, you fix what you can, it's okay to be wrong, and if you can fix something at a later date, I would strongly encourage you to do that. So there's nothing wrong with making adjustments if something isn't going correct. So the authors really mentioned feedback is measuring the next level of work. Um, the problem with feedback is it has to be constant and it has to come from a lot of different people. We're going to talk about the idea of total quality management and 360 feedback because our problem with schools is exactly what's presented in this third bullet. Many people in urban settings or larger school districts will only take feedback from the people that they trust because there's so much just just tumultuous nature and fear that people have in these settings that they only want feedback from people that they trust. That can be a problem as well. It has to come from all stakeholders, including the students, and that's why I'm a big believer in multi-client feedback in education. And when a system does it correctly, it's probably the most effective way that it can work. So the authors really end by talking about accountability and what it should look like in a school setting. Um, I think one of the big ideas is this reflective piece. Uh, if you're not reflecting on what went right and what went wrong, there's no way you're able to sustain it or repeat it if you need to in another building or in another classroom. Um, you have to learn. If there's no learning, then there's no sustainability for long-term improvement. I don't think this is anything new that anybody watching this has not heard. This is a no-brainer. It's something that you should know and it's something that you should practice. So, that's it. Um, the next chapter is going to be from one of my favorite authors in education, and that's Andy Hargraves. Hargraves really looks at education from a business perspective more than anything else. And I like that. I think that's important. Um, I have people that will shudder when they hear the word business linked to school improvement, but you have to realize that business does exist, and business is something that you're going to see in, in any education settings. Um, you have to consider it and see how it works or it doesn't work for it to be effective. So when we get to chapter four, I would encourage you to look at it and I think it's going to be interesting for you. Thank you.